Hi, this is Terry Healy, bringing you some extraordinary transformation. Uh, thanks for tuning in. You're listening to WVLP at 103.1 FM, also live streaming at WVLP.org. I want to thank our show's sponsor. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Ryan Eberhardt from Diamond Residential Mortgage. Um, don't assume all mortgage companies are the same or all loan professionals are the same. They're not. Ryan has a profound concern for his clients and their families and their pocketbooks. Um, his office is conveniently located on Route 30 in Valparaiso. He's at 350 Morthland Drive. His direct phone line is area code 219-707-8429. Ryan, as always, thank you for supporting my show and for supporting Community Radio. Uh, today, I have the privilege and the honor to introduce uh, and interview a lady that I just recently met. Um, I am with Dr. Kalyani Gopal. She is the founder of the Safe Coalition for Human Rights. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, information about what it is you're doing, so I'm kind of going to let you lead our conversation sure. today about what, what all that is about. Um, can you give us a little information about, about that coalition? Sure. So Safe Coalition was formed in 2014 um, after a group of survivors tried to present at the Illinois Psychological Association of which I'm a member. And thanks to the Illinois Psychological Association, actually, we were able to launch this uh, organization, which is a nonprofit. It is focused on human trafficking victims. At that event, at the convention in 2013, we had only six people in the audience, and we had four survivors, which made for a very bad uh, optic. Sure. And as a result of that, uh, we took them later to lunch and said, you know what, today very few people, important people, but very few people heard you. Uh, come next year, the whole world is going to hear you. So having said that promise, one has to keep it. Uh, so I went trapezing from one nonprofit to another nonprofit, asking them to please, in Chicago, uh, give us the, fi you know, the fiscal sponsorship, because the nonprofits had us, the fiscal sponsorship so that we could host this conference. Um, uh, then by the end of it, I started feeling like I was being trafficked. Uh, because they asked me, well, what's in it for us? So the moment you get that question, here I'm thinking, I just want to be able to showcase these ladies and tell the world what an amazing mm -hmm. survivor, what amazing survivors they are, and how much they have struggled, and how incredible they are as human beings to have come through it, and to come to tell us their, uh, their share their story, so to speak, and tell us, hey, we need to be doing more. We need to be giving you employment. We need to be giving you jobs. We need to be giving you s life skills. We need to be able to help you so that you can become productive citizens again of this society. Because they were trafficked from the time they were children, so they didn't have any formal education to speak of. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they could read, write, and everything else. But those, some of them have literally gone on to do their PhDs. It is just an incredible, humbling experience to work with them. Sure. Uh, it's just it's just phenomenal how much they struggle and how how deep the trauma is and yet they're such warriors they want to come through it they want to fight through it yes they've been through drug addiction yes they've been through uh, uh, just incredible pain with the rape and everything else that they've been through yes they've been burnt they've been betrayed they've been thrown on the streets they've been used and abused multiple times but look at them today. Right. Look at them, how far they've come. So that's what I wanted to showcase. And after this experience, I said, you know, one of my colleagues said to me, she said, forget this, you know. Go get your own nonprofit. Make your own. Mm. Stop asking people to help you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I did. I went that day with her. She and I went that day. Uh, this was last year in March. And we went down to the Illinois Attorney General's office. It was just amazing. Uh, and within a day, we became a nonprofit. We came up with the name Safe Coalition for I Human like Rights, and um, and then we formed the nonprofit. And that this and that October, we had this conference, which is um, it was just a paradigm shift, because usually when you go to conferences, there's people like me who call themselves experts, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. we're psychologists, we're doctors, we are whatever we are. And then the people who are survivors and thrivers and warriors, they're called victims. Ooh. So it's always us versus them. We are going to be treating you so that you get better. Yeah. And it is such a, it's almost like a condescending, uh, very, 
I don't know, it's just an icky kind of situation. So I was, so I told the group, and there was about 100 people in that room. This is my very first con conference with uh, human trafficking. And I told them, I said, you know, today, we are, it's not us versus them. This entire conference is us all together. And the real experts are the ones sitting on the podium. So I got like eight or nine folks, so all survivors that I knew, uh, that I'd worked with. And I put them on the podium. It was just empowering just in terms of the visuals. They were up on the podium, on at the chairs, the yes. table. They were elevated. And the rest of us were down below. Yes. yes. So you see the dynamic yes. shift between just psychologically. Well, it set the intention. It is the it, total yeah. it set the intention <laughs> for the entire oh, for the entire three days. And when they realized that this was a group effort versus us teaching them to get better in their lives. Right, right. To fix them. It became to fix them. Mm -hmm. It just changed the entire conference. They, from the next three days, the, the mood in the room was you could see the dynamic shift mm -hmm. between the sense of power that these women now had. Mm -hmm. Men and women, they were both. And the sense of power they had and that entire goal of making them feel empowered right. was just what we got in those three days. I love it. And I thought that was the first and last end. That was the end of my conference. That was the end of my promise, right? <laughs> I made that promise. I kept it. Okay, it was a back, time? back to my <laughs> private practice. I'm done. Ah. Right? But what happened mm. as a result of that, that literally, mm, I mean, this was like a, I don't know what even to call it, like a catalyst. Mm. <clears throat> and um, what happened was that out of that conference came a massive shift to give us more, tell us what to do. What can we do from now? We are, we are now we are all energized. We all want right. to do more. We want to collaborate. We created a global task force out of that. And so from the global task force, now we have this, the group of them just got together and they created a Facebook group on Safe Coalition for Human Rights. Yeah. They created this whole, they did everything. I didn't do anything. Literally, I've done nothing. They did all of that <coughs> and did, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, from the Global co Coalition, what we've done since then is then we had Safe 2016. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I can do this once in two years. Every year is too much. <laughs> so we went yeah. Safe 2016, did that in D.C., got a group from uh, the DRC Congo. We had uh, Albanian, the Albanian interior minister came. Mm -hmm. We had people coming from very high places, high positions, interacting with our, su our survivor warriors and then, not only that, they actually paid to get them to go to their countries and present. Wow. I was floored. I was floored at the, how it had grown. Yeah. So we grew from 10 countries. And actually, during 2014, what we also did is we said, we don't have to get people to fly to America. You know, the Ebola outbreak was going on in Africa. Mm -hmm. there, was the, uh, there were wars going on around the world. So we said, what we will do is we will give you a link if you have access to any laptop. Mm -hmm. And laptop's accessible, computer's accessible. So if you have access to the internet, you have access to us. Yeah. And we broadcast to 10 countries. The first time in a human trafficking conference we were able to do that. Wow. Anyone has done that. And so we broadcast to 10 countries then. And it was just, uh, it was just, and the feedback we got was tremendous. So it was a tremendous experience. So many questions come up. So, so many questions. When your um, survivor warriors, yeah. were they able to see any kind of uh, reflection of the impact that they had in the community or other lives based on what they were doing? Absolutely. The they Wonderful. went out. They connected with these um, so-called, like I said, the book experts like me. They connected with them. One group actually uh, connected with another group. And what they did is they uh, went to Nepal and they rescued about 50 girls. Just through the conference that connected to each other. UNICEF came in, uh, they did a presentation. UNICEF then hired one of the girls who was at the conference and she became their spokesperson. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, so Airlines International, you know, you hear about the uh, plane where this one girl recognized a young lady in the, it was in the Facebook everywhere. There was an air stewardess who was uh, trained by the Airlines International. Uh, and they, uh, she, she recognized a young girl in the bathroom who had left a note saying, please help me. And then she went back 
And she was able to then rescue this one girl. I heard that story. So Airlines International hired wow. one of our, our, our survivor warriors. I'm getting goosebumps. And she became one of our, their spokespersons. She still is. She goes around. I connect with Nancy a lot. Nancy is the CEO of Airlines International. So she came. So we had all these people come in there. And this became a massive networking group. And they were helping each other. Because I said to them, if you, if you start thinking of the NGO world or the nonprofit world as just a pie, and then you each of you is taking a piece of the pie, then you're thinking, oh my God, I better grab it before someone else mm -hmm, does mm -hmm. because there's just so much grant money mm -hmm. and that's all I can get. I said, you know what, go build a second pie and then have off that and build a third and build a fourth. The only way you can do that is if you collaborate. Mm -hmm. So you can be competitive because traffickers are way above us. They're very collaborative. They, tr they work with one another. If we as NGOs are biting at each other, right. we're going to kill one another and yeah. they're going to just laugh at us. Well, and that's all that wasted energy. And that's all that wasted energy. But look at the talent in the room. Look how mm. much talent there was in that room. I said, if you all get together, one is an attorney, one is a uh, on the ground advocate, another person's a uh, transportation person, drives trucks, all of you get together. Can you imagine the magic that mm -hmm. happens? And it was total magic. Wow. For three days, yeah. And then they all networked and they all got together, helped each other out. Mm -hmm. uh, we formed the Global t Transportation Task Force, the Global Task Force, and of course they formed their Facebook page. So if you w you know people want to be part of that, they can come. Very open. And then um, in 2016, we did the same conference, made it larger. We had, I think, about 30 countries are coming in, participating. Um, 2018, which was last year, we had about 150, 200 people. We had 200 people, and we broadcast to, uh, uh, we, didn't, we lost count of how many countries we had broadcast because they all had the link and they right. signed on. Right. And not only that, we had 73 nations represented. That's 73. And I had aimed for 50. <laughs> I was like, if 50 people, you right. know, c come, that's great. But 73 nations were represented in that conference last year. Um, it was profound, and we had a pre-conference, which was the day before the three-day conference. We had a pre-conference, and in that pre-conference, we had uh, 24 nations which talked to one another about how they could collaborate, and wow, it was just, wow. um, and Safe Coalition actually now has grown so much, so now we have grown we in Tunisia. We're helping the Tunisians with developing a uh, drop drop-in shelter and a safe village which mm -hmm. we're building here in Indiana. So we're helping the Tunisians develop that. In DRC, we worked with them on uh, training the Supreme Court justices. So we trained the entire DRC Supreme Court. Uh, every year now, they're sending a contingent this year again. There's a delegation coming with three DRC people. I just got a request, please send us an invitation. So we're sending them. From India, we have the head of the National Disaster Task Force, the Director General, he's going to be coming. Um, he's part of our team now because he came for our last conference. He just loved it. So he's coming back. We also trained um, as a part of this, as an outshoot of this whole conference. Just started with one conference. But as an outshoot of one conference, we developed a curriculum that was standardized and that we're standardizing, actually, and that we're getting accreditation for the program, which is called the IACT program, the International Accreditation Credentialing a training program for uh, human trafficking experts. So people have mm. to be at least in the field for five years. We're not taking people off the streets mm -hmm. who want to get credential. Mm -hmm. We can get the money, but it's not worth anything to us if you don't have the experience. Okay. So we have, we're asking to have at least five years advocacy experience working with victims of human trafficking. So we call it the master's course. It's a basic course, but it's a master's course where these are people who are already doing the work. So we train the head of the Indian uh, Indian uh, uh, police force. We train the um, uh, the lady who does the advocacy for from Nigeria to, to to Italy. The girls are being the labor trafficking is going on between Nigerian Nigeria and West African countries and East African countries as well to uh, Europe. Italy is the is the port through which they go into Europe. So there's a lot of selling of people, you know, bonded labor. Doing that. DRC, we're working with the uh, Kivu region also because they're having uh, the, the wars between the 
in that area, the Congo area. The Congo is very rich in minerals, mm. but it's been depleted and it's been exploited a lot. And so the women are constantly in a state of war, and they're the ones who actually build the houses and do all of that. And tin is what's mined hugely in DRC, and, and coffee. We did a lot of coffee from there. So anyway, so we're trying to do a, you know, a training all over, and we've been invited by the Ukrainian government to do some training for the education department to educate them on human trafficking because, um, because of the wars and you know, the, the whole situation there. So uh, we are going around the world and uh, we've been invited by a lot of countries to do training for them as well. Wait, so it's just from that little conference <laughs> this is 2014. In, in such a such a short period of time. It is. It's been. Uh, this is actually our fifth year. We yeah, just started I, our fifth year. I'm just in shock that you yeah. had that kind of a kind of attraction. Yeah. And the United Nations. Uh, we invited them. They're going to be coming in. Um, yeah, I, I'm working with the World Bank now. They invited us to do a study with them. On uh, so they're developing. Uh, so the World Bank is now getting into the whole field of human trafficking because it's an economic issue. Sure. Uh, human sure. trafficking is a public health issue. Human trafficking is a mental health issue. Human trafficking is a financial issue. So it's it's all about money. It went from a um, 9.5 billion dollar industry back in 2007 to a 15 billion dollar industry 32 billion dollar industry actually 32 billion dollar industry in 2012 and now at this point we are a 150 billion dollar industry when you include labor and sex trafficking so wow. it is growing by leaps and bounds and the gangs have now gotten into it because sure, there's money there's money right and because right. with the gangs what happens is uh, the cocaine and everything and heroin that has money. The phenytoin, the, all the medi all these opioids have money. But once you use an opioid, it's gone. Mm -hmm. But a girl or a boy mm -hmm. has a shelf life. Has a shelf life, life, a very very long shelf mm -hmm. life. So you know either they get killed, or they kill themselves. Right. So within ten, seven to ten years, many of them are dead. And if they're not dead, they're in a revolving hospital door with tumors, backaches, any one of the survivors I talk to, MS, cancer, you know, there are multiple, multiple neurological disorders that they suffer from, psychological, because the body, mind, and spirit kind of go together. You break the spirit, you know, you destroy the mind, you destroy the body, right. and the spirit is going downhill with it, you know, and then no matter, it's like you keep fighting to come up, and you think you've reached a point where you can dig yourself out of that hole, and suddenly, Something happens, something small, a little trigger, and you're right back where you started. Yeah. And you're like, how did this even happen? And you're beating yourself up because you're saying, how could this happen to me? Why didn't I, why wasn't I more careful? Yeah. Or why didn't I recognize? So people, they're so busy beating themselves up that they forget how much progress they made. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's where we are with all of this. And now we're going towards housing. Because the first uh, conference came up with jobs. We need jobs. We need, we need to raise awareness, really, was the first conference. Agreed. We need to yeah. raise awareness. Okay, we did the raising awareness. 2016, we did the raising awareness. 2016, we need jobs. People need jobs. We've got to give them jobs. Okay, we said, okay, let's formulate some way to give them jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we developed this year, we developed a survivor mentor program. And I just did the certification on May 4th the very first survivor mentor certification program. They all got certificates. Oh, wow. There were 10 of them. And we did this right here in Northwest Indiana. And um, some of them are training to become trainers as well yeah, so that go. they can yeah. have ongoing yes. funding. But the ones of the mentors, thanks to a grant we received from the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute. We are so grateful to the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute in Indianapolis. They gave us a grant so that we are able now to train agencies for free in oh. the area. Uh, we don't. They, we will not be charging them. We are doing free therapy for victims of sexual assault. Oh my goodness! Domestic violence oh free therapy. My um, there's four therapists, all licensed, um, for victims of s domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Just in the past three months, I've identified ten individuals who are trafficked. And Indiana has about 56 total in a year that's called in that they've identified. So right. in my practice, 
if just people walking in, if I've been able to identify 10, imagine how many more there really are. Well, it, because you're trained to identify. Correct. You know, you're, 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 Correct. Your uh, radar has been exactly. up for that. So, so, so you're providing the training so that other, so other, other providers can, can also do it. <sighs> so we're going to be training everyone for free because yeah. thanks to the grant. We're very, very fortunate. It's We've also applied to the Legacy Foundation for a grant mm -hmm. to train EMS and to train um, other folks so that we could uh, have our survivors trained. Right. So this gives employment. The more employment you give folks who are coming out of very traumatic events, out of poverty even, the more employment opportunities we give them, the more they're able to sustain their families. Well, it's, a, it's an empowerment tool. It is, absolutely. To have to have that kind of, all, the, all that comes around that. Absolutely. Having a job. It's not just a job and a paycheck. It's, it's, it's more what, than that. It's what it means to the individual having Exactly, that. and it improves their parenting style because it improves their self-esteem, improves their confidence. Absolutely. I mean, it has a very beautiful domino yes. effect. A good one. Yes. You yes. know, where Agreed. so the outcome is good. I always feel if you can change the life of one individual, you change the life of generations yes, that yes, follow. Yes, 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 yes. Isn't it? Yes, I have had that experience. Yes, yeah, it's yes, another word because that it, mm -hmm. is, it is just amazing. And treatment is so easy for trauma. We used to think that you need, you know, years and years and years of trauma treatment. I can do trauma treatment in four sessions, six sessions, ten sessions, and, and people move on with their lives because wow. it's all in the brain. We don't have to have these lengthy, prolonged Crying on the couch. Yeah, yeah. crying right. on the couch. In fact, you don't right. have to cry at all. Right. You know, because I don't need to know your entire story to do trauma work. Really? I don't need to know it anymore because all trauma is visually stored. Interesting. Which is why when you ask people, tell me about what happened to you, it's almost like a deadpan look you get on right. their faces. Sure. Like, okay, you know, because they separate the emotion from the thoughts. Well, they have to to survive it. And that's there's a clinical term for it. But that's but when they go to testify, the jury is looking at them like, wow, this didn't even affect you. Right, right. But that is so false. It did affect them. It's just to survive or to function from day to day. Mm -hmm. They either have to drug themselves up you know, or they have to, um, they have to somehow separate the two. Yeah, they have to dissociate somehow. They have to. So all trauma is visually stored. I think of trauma sometimes being energetically stored in different areas of the body. I've it never certainly it. is. It's, yeah. it's absolutely that as well. Yeah. But think about that's called muscle. The body has memories. Yes, it does. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you trigger a point, if you fall, for example, mm. if, and sometimes people have a fall and suddenly they have all this severe depression yeah. and anxiety and everything else. Sometimes that fall could have been a trigger point right. where they were abused, mm -hmm. you know, and that could set up a chain of events, but nobody's ever asked them. Right. Well, we're not trained to think that way in the Western world, you know, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't look the that way. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk is a, is a trauma, traumatologist, and one of the works he's done is uh, he's called, written a book called The Body Keeps Score, mm. and uh, the body has actually memories. So oh. if you actually have, you know, it says areas in your body, it could be a... It could even be someone hitting you on your elbow or mm -hmm. just slamming you in across, across the door or something like that. Because people think of domestic violence as being beating someone else up. Domestic violence is not, even though it's very important, of course, part of it, which the more common myth that domestic violence is physical abuse. Domestic violence is financial abuse. Domestic violence is psychological abuse. It's sexual abuse. Domestic violence is sexual abuse. Yeah. So when you tell uh, when when you tell somebody, you know what, you're no good. You don't even know how to balance your checkbook. You're so stupid. You don't even know the difference between what he's saying and what he's doing. You're so dumb. Nobody will ever give you a job. This is domestic violence. Sure. But people don't think of it as that. People think of domestic violence as being more physical. Right. You know, bruises on your face and from dramatic dramatic sort of stuff. Well, I think that's probably where the whole conversation and the awareness started years and years and years ago. Correct. So it just takes a while until that all kind of catches up and uh, and kind of, you know, it evolves into what it's evolved into. Correct. Um, but, you know, it, I have to tell you, in such a short period of time, how remarkable it is that you're actually, your coalition is actually working on things um, on the ground floor. You're, you're on the front line of the conversation. Absolutely. But then you're also 
up here in the whole yeah, education. Because I see them every day. I see patients every day within the, within the clinic in Mid America Psychological and Counseling Services, for example. We see about I would say one out of five patients I see, or one out of four patients I see on a daily basis have a history of sexual assault, domestic violence, or human trafficking. And this is just walking into the clinic. Yeah. Yeah, and if they don't have it, the parents, one of the parents has it. Right. It's yeah. an ongoing thing. It's also a financial problem because, you know, we can tell, it's very easy for a therapist to say, well, you, this guy is treating you so badly, leave him and go find someone else. It's not that easy. No. Who's going to pay your electric bill? Who's going to pay for your food? Who's going to send your kid to this Catholic school or Christian school she's going to? Someone's paying those bills. Well, so it's very easy for us to sit on a high seat and say, well, mm -hmm. you know what, gee, you, you're really stupid. You should be leaving this mm -hmm. guy. It's like, okay, how can I empower you mm -hmm. so that you can continue to be in this relationship you want to be and this person stops being the way they are? Or they Sometimes leave. They or leave. they leave. Yeah, because so you've changed. And you pay, and they pay ongoing for this. So how do you help them transition without destroying their lives? I think in, in the world according to Terry, it's about healing that individual. Correct. So there's like mindset that was that was there that they attracted that person. Right. That did those things. Right. And then in those kind of relationships, there's a there's a psychological deterioration that happens. Absolutely. There's a buy in that's happening. Absolutely the, the there's a buy in. And the buy in is and you said it so beautifully because a buy in I have a two year old child. That's the father. Right. I never had a father in my life. I want my baby to have a spider. Right, right, I mean, right, these right, are psychological yes. binds, and people who yes. just, you know, pontificate on this, I always say, do you even see these people mm -hmm. on a daily basis? Do you even work with them? It's so easy to say, do this, do that, but do you even work with them on a daily basis? Do you understand their lives? Because if you don't understand their lives, don't pass judgment, because right. you haven't lived their life. Well, and you, you can't tell somebody from your state of consciousness right. that they should react a certain way because their state of consciousness is not the same. Absolutely. They may not have evolved to that level yet Absolutely. or healed to that level. Okay. Um, yeah. I just, I feel for the people, though, I'm going back to when you were talking about people that have come out of that dark hole, you mm -hmm. know, that they've been trafficked in right. and that, that something small will drop them back into the into the hole, right. how, how easy right. that would be. Right. Um, so are you, like, when you talk about the, the healing of trauma that you do, that's, like, amazing to me, I'll tell you. Trauma is very treatable, very, very treatable. And I, that's what I do. Of all my patients that I keep are the severely impaired ones, the ones that have gone to treatment everywhere, and yeah. then they finally come, and then I do, do therapy, and then they're, they're fine. Are they're fine. Any of the tools that you use in that something that you can bring into the education that you're doing with Coalition? I do. Actually, I train therapists, and they ask me, can you please record what you do and mm -hmm. just show it to us so we can... So I, 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 one of the ladies actually is going to record it, but... Um, I'm a little careful because patients can say, yeah, go ahead and record me, but then a couple of days later they feel violated. Sure, sure. So I don't record anything. So right. I, I can do a demonstration. I do demonstrations. I did a demonstration in 2018, the mm -hmm. conference we had here, and uh, I showed them how to do it. So we had a volunteer from the group come in and do it. And so she, she writes for me. She sleeps well. Yeah. For the first time in 40 years, she slept through mm -hmm. the night. That's lovely. Yeah, you can feel that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That to me, that's that's what I do. That's right. what I love doing, and I think it's so doable. It's just sad that so many people don't know about no. that. There's help out there. No. So I'd love for people to join us. I'd love for people to sponsor us because a lot of the things we do are free. Right. We need sponsors always for our uh, victims, especially for housing. I have two people who need housing desperately, and they need financial support. So if people are listening to you today that mm -hmm. can support us in any way and support our survivor or our warriors, I'd be very grateful. How can they do that? How do they reach out? They can call me at 312-998-2339. That's 312-998-2339. Or they can call our main number, which is 1-833-SAFE-CHR. So it's our 833-SAFE-CHR number, and, uh, and, and we can go from there. Wonderful. They can also email us at admin at safechr.org. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I have no doubt that you'll get some contribution just from I hope so. Yeah, some I of the exposure so. that Thank you, Terry, today. for oh, yeah. taking the time and speaking yeah. to me today. Well, it's, a, it's an honor to talk to you. Um, Likewise. A few more questions to ask you, though, because a little bit we more have time. another meeting. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're about 40 minutes in, so uh, to 
to the time that we need. Do you need to, to exit the meet to exit? Can I take a s five second break to sure. find out why Ashley yeah, interrupted absolutely. us? Okay, absolutely. great. Thanks. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of fill people in that are tuning in here uh, midstream. Um, I'm having the privilege to interview a Dr. Kalyani Gopal. She is the founder of the Safe Coalition for Human Rights. Uh, and I met her recently at an event, uh, an awareness event, uh, for child suicide prevention and the opioid crisis. And she was one of the panelists um, for that event, and that was an awareness event as well. But uh, just recently, in the past couple of weeks, we did that. And so uh, mutual introduction, and it's just, I have to tell you, if you've not been listening, what, uh, what Dr. Gopal is kind of explaining to us is, you know, what has happened since she created this foundation or this not-for-profit in 2014, the, the, um, the way that she's expanded and the working in the front line, working with the people that have been trafficked to bring empowerment to their lives, to bring jobs to them so that they can uh, go out and create um, you know, a, different, a different experience for themselves, like rewrite a story for themselves. She's also uh, very, um, very much uh, involved with educating other professionals, uh, legislators, governments, city systems, those sort of things as well. Uh, so she's kind of like take a, the whole thing is tackling it from two different levels. So just kind of bringing in people that sometimes be people that come in midstream and so I like to catch them up from where we are. So, yeah. um, so they're great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So here's another question that I had for you too. When you were talking about um, your survivor warriors asking, you know, what's in it for me when they did that first conference, it's like uh, that you definitely got them connected to how they're impacting and influencing other people's lives, which is a what's in it for me. But yeah. have you thought the about The survivor warriors were not so much the ones saying what's in it for me. It's the organizations oh, that are working it. that are working with human trafficking victims. Yeah. You would think they would say, Yeah, let's let's, let's all go, help. Let's go. let's go. Let's do this conference. Let's right. give them a you know, a platform. Right. No, they were all about, you know, well, how what can we get from it? I'm gonna charge you four percent interest on whatever you make. And I was thinking no. to myself, I'm not going to make a and penny money, from right, this. Right, this is not money. No, this is all free for yeah. the survivors who come in. Right. Uh, I, I have to pay for the hotel. I have to pay for all these overheads. I'm just saying I don't want to pay taxes if I don't have to. Right, right. Because as a nonprofit, you don't pay taxes. But otherwise, mm -hmm. I'd have paid like 20% you know, taxes. And I said, I just want to make sure that all the money we make goes, if we make anything, it's going to go towards right. them. I actually end up putting in ten thousand dollars of my own money into the conference because yeah. we we had to you know pay for everything, right? And so that's life. But but the reality is that uh, the survivor warriors at, at by the end of it, they have actually they stayed in touch with me. I actually have people who are now at this point uh, extremely involved with uh, with developing the curriculum. I include them. I give them credit on everything I do. Um, I, I ask them, please, you know, do a radio show, do something, right. do get your name out there. Because the problem is, even among the survivors of human trafficking, there is a competitive need because that's how they were groomed oh, I see, to yeah. compete with each other sure, in sure. order to get the most attention from the you know person who was trafficking them. Right, right. And unfortunately, that plays into the dynamic of how they live their lives. And some of them recognize it, some of them don't. So they get into this competitive thing. If someone gets more attention, for example, has written a book, has published a book, is prettier or whatever else, and gets more attention, there is a sense of competitive jealousy mm -hmm. that goes with some of the others. Not all, but a few. So they bring down that one person. Right. Or they bring down the NGO that is promoting that person. So it's a, it's a very sad but real, re realistic, you know, uh, problem that we have with the survival world. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that existed, but that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's the survivor networks we have, and they're very, they're very kind. They let me join the survivor networks. And um, they, they do, they're now they're getting more stronger. Um, Obama, actually, President Obama had a task force with 12 survivors on it, labor and sex trafficking. That's the first task force that ever formed at the national level. Wow. Yeah, they're very wonderful people. Um, they're also part of my team, some of them. And they are all trying to open up their own uh, safe houses. Uh, sometimes the safe houses work, sometimes they don't because these are trigger points for them. Every time they see someone come in with a similar history, 
what protection do they have? They really don't have a whole bunch of protection for themselves. Wow. So that can be difficult. So you're looking at creating housing then in Indiana. Correct. And what uh, can you give us a little bit idea what the vision is for that? So what we're looking at doing is building a um, uh, village, uh, which is resort style. Okay. So it'll be very beautifully landscaped, maintained by our residents. Okay. And we call them residents because that's what they really are going to be. Uh, and be maintained by our residents. And they're going to be um, about 10 cottages, eight cottages of which are going to be for the females. Mm -hmm. to somehow engage traumatized it does not happen there's, there's psychological and There's other pathology that does. Works with me, we work together. Ties, she has 35 years with the Chicago public school system. Work I've uh, worked Boys um, Residential Senior Center, and one of them and, uh, so I did treatment with them. I was an intern at that time, and New York to meet with my previous supervisor. Um, so we So, someone that happens to uh, get the benefit of that, and mm -hmm. how long do you anticipate they stay in the cottage or need the service? Well, for? we are not looking at more than a year. Okay. But they okay. can stay for as long as they want. Okay. But treatment should not go more than a year. Should not have to go more than a year. Okay. Because the idea is to have as many people as we can, sure. you know, so, so they move on. We don't want it to make, become their crutch, because right. oftentimes it's like with patients, you know, they'll come and see me and they'll get really much better. Suddenly, when I say you're ready for discharge, they'll come back the next week with 10 new symptoms sure, that they never sure. had before, right? Right. So there's a sense to, to, to stay with you. Right. So what we want to do is to be able to have them transition from being in the cottage to becoming leaders in the cottages, okay. to then becoming an, a, a transitional housing outside. Mm -hmm. So they have one foot in, one foot out, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they can stay that way for a while, but they're not in the village. Right. So that gives room for the next person to come in. Nice. And so they can come back in and stay for a couple of days. So we'll have a cottage where they can just stay. If they yeah. suddenly feel scared and frightened, they can come right back in. And then mm. strength get, get strong again and go back out. That's wonderful, I can see that vision. Yeah, that feels, that feels, yeah, it feels right. It's, it's very important to have that transitional period. And the transitional period is usually about six to eight months. I have to ask, what what is it, or what was it, do you know, that actually sparked this for you, that you had a passion for this and a calling for it? Um, yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry, did you say that? That's okay. Just curious, what was it in your life that created the spark or the passion for you to... to I think what happened is uh, I come from a family where one of my family members was molested as a child. And she leaned on me very heavily through our years. We could fairly close family member. And so when, so when I grew up and I was like 16, 15, 16, I was starting college at 16. I think I was 15 and a half at that time. And then I uh, started my bachelor's degree. And um, the topic came up in a class I was attending. 
and the professor was talking about, you know, children are hurt and children are abused. And I was thinking, wow, that would be an interesting thing to take on. And I didn't mm -hmm. know much about it, but I was going to take it on. So I did, and then she sat with me, and we worked on a project uh, with the girls in jail who yeah. go to jail, who get incarcerated. Young girls, you know, between my age, they were all my age, I literally, they, I was in college and they were in jail. That was the only difference. Right. And so I was about 16, 17, and I was collecting data for my bachelor's degree. And um, I went to the jail, and uh, my dad was in the army, so he was a fairly senior officer in the army, so it made, he, he, they opened doors. That opens doors, lots of doors in <laughs> India. And so in this country as well. And so uh, I was given the Jeep, they gave me the army Jeep, and I was able to go in, and the police escort actually, had a police escort, and they went into the jail, and I collected data on these girls, but the problem was, and my data was just self-esteem, you know, simple bachelor's degree data. Sure. But what I found was that these girls were actually disappearing at night, and they would come back in the morning, and they in the morning when I'd go in, they would say, hey, they call you Didi, Didi means older sister. Mm -hmm or just sister, like a respectful term for a sister. They said, hey, Didi, you know, uh, so-and-so left, and she um, uh, she's going to be back at 2 o'clock. Because I was collecting data, and I said, where is she? I need, you know, information. And, uh, and I didn't understand. And I, now, years later, after putting two and two together mm -hmm. and speaking to people since then, going back and saying, what exactly happened in that jail? They are like, we couldn't tell you. You're very young. <laughs> but really what was happening is that these girls were servicing delegates that come for international conferences. You know, ministers wow. come from all over the world. They come to New Delhi. The capital cities are the problem. Right, right. D.C. is a problem. Right. Within D.C., within literally five miles of D.C. is a kiddie track of the, of the Capitol building is, the, is the, uh, what we call a kiddie track, which is little girls dressed up in really high, high shorts. Uh, walking the kiddie track and getting picked up literally mm -hmm. five miles away. So it's happening in all capitals across the world because when these dignitaries come in, there's a lot of other soft benefits that they end up getting. Right. Um, this is one of them. Wow. Child. Child rape. It's, 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 it's just so yeah. upsetting. And it's the jails are a perfect place because no one's watching for these girls. Right. And then the wardens right. get paid under the table. Everyone's getting paid. Everyone's comfortable. A lot of bribes, a lot of black money going on. Sure. Yeah, so sure. these girls would come back, and then we, I wouldn't see them because they were, you know, resting. Right, right. So, so all of that. So, that, that so, so I was, yeah, I was, that's when this started, uh, the right. whole process for me. And I didn't know I started that young. But years later, when I was in this country and I was doing my PhD, and I was, um, I was actually in Vanderbilt University doing my PhD, and there was this young girl who came in, and she was about seven years old, and she sat on my lap, and she said, I really just, she was very attached to me for some reason, and she said to me, she said, you know, my daddy's touching me. And I said, yeah, of course, he's probably giving you a, bi a bath or something. You know, she's giving you, he's, he's your dad. He's, I'm very, very close to my dad, so I couldn't imagine anything. And so she says, no, my daddy's touching me, and it hurts. And that was my whole foray into child sexual abuse. But these kids wouldn't talk to anybody else, but they'd tell me everything. Right. So, and then the, the, my supervisor at that time said, you know, all these kids are coming and talking to you. Have you thought about working with kids who are sexually abused? And I was like, no, because I'm trying to do mental retardation. <laughs> that oh. Those days it's called mental retardation. Yeah. And I was working with Vanderbilt in improving their cognitive skills so that instead of teaching them in very traditional ways that we do IQ testing and traditional IQ, we were coming up with ways that are more unique so that they could connect with them and build their cognitive strategies so that they could go from a low IQ to a normal IQ is what I was shooting for. That well, was like my that goal. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that was why I was in school yeah, yeah. <laughs> for my PhD. But yeah. of course, all that got back on the sidelines and then um, I started working with foster children and I came to Indiana and um, from working with foster kids, foster kids were running away. Why are they running away? Go back home. And I got a call years ago from a foster child. And then I said, why don't you go home? You shouldn't be out in the streets at this hour of the night. But turned out probably she was being trafficked. Yeah. And that's stuck in my brain, and I can't get it out. 
So every time I work with young people, I always, you know, and there's, there's this hint of trafficking, I always go and explore that. Because many of these girls are diagnosed bipolar. They're diagnosed in bipolar, ADHD, young, older young girls, or, you know, like 18, 19 are diagnosed schizophrenic. Nobody diagnoses them with trafficking and trauma. Which, so, which, is, actually, which yeah. is what the medications don't work. They're just zombied out. Right. And right. the medicines don't work. Well, it doesn't heal the neurological it imbalance. Doesn't, it, it just it puts doesn't a heal anything. Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. So it actually literally makes them into um, ineffective human beings. They can't function at all. Right. Yeah. You can't just shut down one thing and not everything. Exactly. You everything can't shut down one thing. The other thing is going to act out. Yeah. <laughs> everything has everything to go Everything is an outlet. Have you thought about, like, chronicling and, like, writing a book about this journey and... No, Maybe. I haven't really. Because I, 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 everyone's doing something, and I, I, I'm doing my part, but I think everyone's doing something amazing. I, I mean, look at you. Look at your story. Look at your life. Yeah. You're doing something amazing. So I think everyone's doing amazing. If all of us wrote books, there'd be an awful lot of books. There would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, there's all of us. We have to read them all. We can listen to some of them as well. It's yeah. just, I think that, you know, what, what is remarkable, about, uh, many things are remarkable, but what is so significant to me is, like, the, the traction that you've had in such a short period of time and the levels that you're that you're working in are just that's what's surprising um, but I you know I couldn't do it alone I oh have no, Gordon no, no, yeah. who's sitting right here who probably doesn't want to be on the camera but he's here I couldn't do it without Gordon who's mm -hmm. a volunteer who's been a volunteer for about two years now Gordon I, I don't I've lost count mm -hmm. for a long time he went to Colorado and we we were too attractive for him so he came back, <laughs> to us. Came back to he loved us too much that's Actually, a, that's his girlfriend. Pull. His girlfriend's the one who pulled him back. Oh, I guess gotta say, <laughs> with Indiana and Colorado, I think it's right, pretty right, easy right, to right, right. go. So he came back home, um, but he's also got family here, right? So that that brought him back. We have him. We have Mark Price, who's with the who's a financial consultant. So one of the things I really dislike about the nonprofit world is the top heavy mm. approach, mm -hmm. where they're making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But the people who really need the money don't get anything. It doesn't funnel down. Right. So right. we're all volunteers. I'm a volunteer, so I don't right. get paid a penny. Right. Uh, Gordon's a volunteer. Mark's a volunteer. So we have our financial books separate from our organization. Mm -hmm. So Mark is collecting all the money for the village. So 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 far right now, we have 80000 that's pledged, okay. 3000 in the bank okay. literally given to us. We need to raise a million dollars okay. to start this project because the land itself is about four five hundred thousand we are literally saying if any one of your listeners anyone who's willing to help us is willing to buy the land for us we don't need the money we want the land if they're willing to buy the land and give it to us at a 99 year lease or something like that or a permanent lease that's even better we basically give it to us as a lease and so we can start building and if we have construction companies that come together because this is a community mm -hmm. And if we can fundraise to help, you know, because people have to pay their bills too. Sure. So if we could have enough that we're able to do the land, the construction, we are ready to go. We have the whole programming done. We want to be able to take to 10 acres of that land and build, f just get food to feed our population, our homeless population, and have them work in. They're homeless, but they're not helpless. Right. They can actually be put to work. There's no reason for us to have poverty, none at all zero reasons for poverty so just a quick question you're talking about um maybe having somebody come in and purchase the land for you are you open to the conversation of having land donated absolutely we'd okay. be thrilled good to know because i have had that with a thrilled with an we'd be thrilled if yeah. they would donate the land how uh, what kind of parcel you're looking for i know the 10 acres for the farming but so we're looking at about a minimum of 30 to 40 acres okay. of land okay um that we can actually build on uh, because we want the buffer around it so the United States Security, which is headed by Commander Ed Peralta, he's a vet. So we're having veterans reintegrated. And all our Indiana veterans, we're going to give them employment. We want to give them housing. We want them to be able to stay right there. If they don't want to stay there, that's fine. Right. We want teachers to be uh, included. Teachers are retired, but they're too young to retire. And they have so much more to offer. We right. want them involved. We want student leaders the Christian youth leaders to be involved because they can give back and they can train the next generation. So we have so much that we can give and so much we can we can employ so many people. Right. We can serve so many we people. We can serve so yeah. many people because not only are we serving the people 
in the in the village, we're also serving the at-risk youth in schools. So we're taking away the burden, uh, if you want to call it that, of uh, of teaching the kids who are at high at risk mm -hmm. and giving them a reason to study, a reason to go to school, okay. a reason to have a future. So we don't have suicide so much. Yeah. We have so many kids talking about suicide, yeah. Yeah. as you saw in the panel, yeah. in the panel that we did. So um, do you do any fundraising efforts? We do, but we are not very good at it. Okay. Because uh, uh, we are a whole, because you know, most organizations pay their fundraising, they have a whole fundraising department and they have, we, we want to do a capital campaign. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we are just, we need all the support. We need people with experience to join us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so, That's so far what we've done is basically by word of mouth, by goodwill. So just to call out to anybody that, that has that experience, and I know that, that I'm tentacle to a lot of people now that, that do that, um, and it's it's something that they come in, vol in a volunteer setting Absolutely. and they have, the, they have the experience of it and are able to create that. Absolutely. Um, that would be a wonderful thing to start working on as well. Absolutely. Is to do some, more, is to do some fundraising. Right. Um, aside, in addition to the capital campaign. That right. You're, that you're and in exchange, there. you know, if they need therapy, they need medication, they need any kind of support, help, we are there to help. I love that. I love that. Um, good for listeners, or listeners to know, because you never know who, whose heartstrings get pulled. Right. And uh, and they need to have a place that they can step in. Absolutely. And support. Absolutely. Uh, so you're talking about, and I love what you're describing, and I can see all that. What's the uh, What's the target for that? Do you have an intention to have? We a are launch? looking at uh, breaking ground if we can in June next year. Oh wow! That's our goal. Yes. That's wow. That is our goal. Well, you know what? With the speed that your trajectory is on. I'm not as surprised by that. That's a little quicker, but I thought, wait a second, look how far you've we come can do this. in a four-year... A lot of people take the money. They have grants that they get or they get foundation money that they have to spend by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And they'll create programs just for the sake of creating them. And these right. programs don't last. What they right. do is they'll have a conference. Right. And they just pay for a bunch of people to come in and speak and they right. leave and nothing happens. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Right. We don't want to do that. We're right. not asking for money. You, they're usually asking, when we ask for money, it's for programs that get funded. Mm -hmm. And the programs, when they get funded, are, pe are being run by people who have lived that life, it's people right. with lived experiences. So that's what we're looking for. For the safe village is going to, is going to pay for the teachers, it's going to pay for the, the security, for the veterans that we have in our, in our state. It's going to pay for maintenance. It's going to pay for landscaping. It's going to pay for so many things. It's going to pay for the education of one child that changes that child's life forever. Right. You know, we have moms who have been raped and have babies because they, of course, abortion. Everyone doesn't want to have abortion. Many people don't want to have abortion. They want to give birth to the babies, and the babies have a right to life. And so given that right to life, we want to be able to sustain that family and protect that family as well. So there's a lot of levels at which we are able to reach with donors. Yeah. Yeah. And donors can pick and choose. For example, they can buy a cottage and that cottage and the land goes together and the construction of the cottage and the land, they can pay for that. You know, people have stocks and bonds and then maybe the interest they make off the stocks and bonds, they can, they can afford to share that interest with us and donate that interest with us. They have a house that they are just sitting there that they really don't need anymore. They can donate the house to us. The proceeds of the sales would go towards the village. Is it what I think what was amazing to me when I started working in a non-for-profit mm -hmm. uh, sector was uh, that there are quite a number of people with sizable amounts of money that every year they're looking for the place to put that. Right. Um, so that's out there. So that is worry. that is out there. Chicago. Um, our uh, Indiana DCS is going to be free at no charge. We always invite them every year. Um, uh, our prosecutors, we would like them to come. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, we're based in Indiana, so we want a lot of folks from Indiana to come. Right. Uh, last year, we had some people from Indiana. I think the sexual assault group that presented. Um, our survivors come for free. We don't charge them at all. Our volunteers are not usually charged when they come in. So we need to raise, for the conference itself, we are looking at about $50,000 okay. to pay for the survivors, to pay for the food, to pay for the, um, but I wanna make sure that you put my name front and center. We are more than happy to do it. Oh, wonderful. You know, if people are willing to pay for a luncheon, which is about, at this point, the luncheon is going to be $10,000.
So if you want to break it into two, uh, four people paying $2,000 as a group each, then their names come in the luncheon. So the luncheon is actually an award ceremony. So they will have a massive banner with just their signs nice. because they're paying for the luncheon. Nice. Yeah, things like that. So if they, whatever anyone wants to pay, even if it's $10, you know, if you, if, if you have your heart in it and if you feel like, you know, I really want to contribute, but I, j but I can't afford so much money. I can give you mm -hmm. 10 bucks. Fine, give us 10 bucks. We don't have a problem. We'll, we'll acknowledge you in writing. Right. That's no wonderful. amount is too small or too big. Right. Well, and I love that you can let someone say, this is where my heart is calling. You know, yeah. that I would like it to go here. Yeah. That's kind Absolutely. of a nice, that's a unique feature to Absolutely. To people, donating. because people, people give from the heart. Yeah. Do. You know, you give because something resonates with you, and you say, "I really, f I feel this it matters to me. This is important. That that cottage there could be my legacy to future generations. Because I won't be around forever. Right. But mm -hmm. my children can say, my dad and mom did this. Yeah. For the betterment of humanity. Yeah. I mean, how much that that means so much. Yeah. And then how it's impacted. It's such lives. a it's such a huge moral high ground mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to start with. So I want to thank everybody who's tuned in. You've been listening to WVLP 103.1 FM, also live streaming at WVLP.org. Also want to give a thank you to our show sponsor, Brian Everhart with Diamond Residential Mortgage. Um, if you need any financing for residential, commercial, refinancing purchases, all the above, uh, contact Brian. He's an incredible human being and will provide exceptional service to you and your family. His office is conveniently located on Route 30, 350 Morthland Drive, Direct phone line for Ryan is 219-707-8429. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for your support. And I want to thank you so much, Dr. Rapal. This well, was thank a wonderful you, Terry. Interview. This was wonderful for me as well. Yeah. So kudos to you and uh, wish you nothing but success with everything you've taken on. Likewise. You too. Thank you so much. <laughs>